Um, my name is Sam Cook, and I'm one of the, uh, I guess, third year pulmonary and critical care fellows. I'm in my six year postgraduate training now, and I've got about five weeks to be done, so pretty excited about that. It's been a long time. Um, today we're going to talk about mechanical ventilation. Um, it's an overview of it, but it also will go into kind of in depth certain parts of it where we can kind of troubleshoot a ventilator from uh, the bedside, kind of see the big things that we look for um, and ideally that y'all can then look for and, uh, and tell us when things have gone really wrong or hopefully things are going really right. I want to give credit for uh, this presentation, at least in a large part, to Dr. Al Lau, who was a former uh, professor here in the Department of Critical Care. Um, so he, uh, he generated a lot of this and I just kind of tweaked it. So the objectives, uh, we're going to go through the modes of ventilation, uh, settings and monitoring, uh, when you decide that it needs to be intubated and put on mechanical ventilation, and then kind of the ventilation strategies for two big kind of categorically different diseases, that of obstructive lung disease and then that of more restrictive lung disease, so increased resistance with your airways disease and decreased compliance for uh, your kind of restrictive ARDS type diseases. And then lastly, what do we kind of look at when we want to uh, extubate or liberate patients from the ventilator? Uh, you know, there's a, a stepwise process that we always go through and and we try to adhere to that so that we, we give our patients the best chance of success of coming off the ventilator. So let's start off with the case here. Um, just kind of highlight some of the examples. So 68 year old male, the COPD, frequent flyer in the ER, well known by everybody, then used to smoke, comes in full breath. So at this time he's pretty diaphoretic, using accessory muscles, he's got some wheezing bilaterally, but he's really tight, really not moving much air. Heart rate's 115, blood pressure's high, respiratory rate's high, low grade temp. ABG comes back while he's on three liters with these numbers. So the question is, first off, what would you do? And then what type of respiratory support would you use on him? see, yesterday people didn't like to talk. I will eventually answer for you, but we will have long, awkward silent pauses. <laughs> All right, same, same, same way. All right, so uh, here you really have, uh, I think we could all agree that this is bad, and you want to support him and the ways to support him are really two big categories of non-invasive or invasive. Um, and so with non-invasive ventilation, we are essentially providing ventilatory support through a, a mask um, that will fit over the, the face. Um, we have really good data, especially at COPD and then CHF that this improves outcomes uh, and then decreases need for uh, mechanical ventilation as well as decreases length of ICU stay. So these are all really important things to think about. Um, the one problem with that here is that your pH is, so that you get underneath the projector here, 7.15 with PCO2 of 70. So you have a very severe acute respiratory acidosis and I think we would all say that this is bordering on the, the need to do something a lot more aggressive than trying out a non-invasive ventilator for a little while and seeing how it does. So with that kind of clinical picture and that ABG, I think we would all agree that we probably are moving out of the realm of non-invasive ventilation and moving more towards invasive mechanical ventilation. So, who is suitable for 
non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. First off, they got to be able to talk to you. Got to be alert. Got to be cooperative. Ideally, they're hemodynamically stable. If not, they're very minimally unstable. They're able to protect their airway. It means that they either don't have copious secretions or they're able to at least manage that. <coughs> Generally, the overall clinical status is going to be supported by the acid base status. Uh, and that's going to be directly reflected by the respiratory acidosis, at least in these types of patients. And then when you just look at them, you're saying, I, I think this patient will, will give them a shot, you know. So like that clinical gestalt that just says, these patients aren't going to do well. And, and that's a good that too. So one of the big things about non-invasive ventilation is, is kind of assessing this whole clinical picture and the two big things that I think we sometimes get a little loose with are their mental status. They're allowed to be somnolent, okay? but they've got to be able to wake up and answer questions. So tell you their name, tell you their birthday, some response. If they're just comatose, that's not appropriate. Uh, and then the other thing that we miss is that, you know, COPD is a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and that chronic bronchitis can be pretty severe with a lot of secretions. And putting a mask over a face in a patient that's already a little bit uh, out of it, and, and now they're bringing up a lot of junk from the lungs. So this, this can really create uh, potential for bad aspiration, or they're bringing all of this junk up into the pharynx and then they're getting dried out because the BiPAPs a lot of times don't have heated humidification on it. And so by the time four hours, five hours later that you go, this isn't working, they're getting worse, you go to intubate, you've got a chunk of thick, rock-hard secretion in the back of the throat that we've actually had to get in the gills and pull out. So probably waited really too long for those. So in that case, we move on to invasive mechanical ventilation. Now, I do want to say that non-invasive ventilation is very good. So in these patients that are appropriate, it is the it is the first step. It's the right thing to do. So it's not inappropriate to try, but reassess quickly and, and if it isn't working, move on to this stuff pretty quickly. So we talk about intubating, what are we trying to do? So, one, we're trying to support uh, ventilation and oxygenation and then decrease the work of breathing. So, um, who thinks the ventilator fixes the patient? Good, no hands. <laughs> this doesn't, it buys you time. Um, what's going to fix this COPD exacerbation? Steroids? bronchodilators, maybe some antibiotics, that's going to reverse it. The ventilator's just there to support it while all those things start to work. Um, and so when we set up, what we're trying to do is what's going to provide the best support for these patients. And so uh, the mode then becomes reflective upon the type of disease state in the patient. The initial settings become important so that you're trying to get them to sync with the ventilator as quickly as possible. And then feedback loop, essentially taking the ventilator alarms, taking the ventilator waveforms and saying, we can adjust this here and there to try to tailor the ventilator to make it more comfortable for the patient. So again, the goals to support uh, ventilation, support oxygenation, and then really to decrease the work of breathing because when you get these patients in bad respiratory distress, they have a very high work of breathing. We know that work of breathing is associated with uh, inducement of lung fibrosis. So even we think now with spontaneous respirations, those that are really driving a uh, high respiratory rate, high work of breathing, putting a lot of stress on the lung probably inducing some type of lung injury independent of whether you have a ventilator on board or not. So we all know about ventilator-associated lung injury, ventilator-induced lung injury. There probably is spontaneous induced lung injury as well. So minimizing that uh, 
is, is really a big key because fibrotic wound disease there's no treatment for and there's no cure for and there's no reversibility. All right, so we talk about variables. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the three big things that happen during a ventilator cycle. And so uh, the first one is a trigger variable, uh, and that's how you get the breath going. Uh, the limit variable, what you're taking your breath up to, and then a cycle variable, what is going to terminate that inspiratory breath. And so you have a bunch of different ways at which all of these can be set. And I'm going to go into these in more detail. So the trigger variable is basically the decision on a breath. So what's going to initiate or start a breath? Uh, and then the setting of a time trigger, this is just a mandatory breath. So you set the rate at 12, it's coming up on that time, and it kicks in. So it gives you that decision that you're going to have the breath. Uh, on a flow trigger, um, so this is where a patient will initiate it, and the ventilator will sense a change in flow, uh, at which point if it reaches that limit of flow or change in flow that it kicks in a breath. And then the other one that you'll see is pressure triggered and this is uh, along the lines of, of the same principle of flow except rather than it detecting a flow change it detects a pressure change and then initiates that breath. Um, and so these are generally the, the way that these are set. You can have a few of these at the same time. You generally will, will not have both pressure and uh, a flow. So, but you'll have your mandatory breath set up, and then you'll see where RT or us or somebody will go in and either put it on a flow trigger or a pressure trigger. And most of the time, that's about two. So, um, but they're diametrically opposed. So, if you turn it on the left, it goes flow. If you turn the knob on the right, it goes pressure. And the higher you go up, the harder it is to initiate that breath. And so the patient has to either generate a higher flow or generate a more negative pressure to get the machine to kick on. So you can, you, the higher you go, the harder it is. And so you really probably don't want very high triggers unless you're attempting to achieve something specific. All right, and then the limit variable. So this is what limits you're setting the ventilator on during that inspiratory uh, cycle. And so on a flow limited, the ventilator is not going to generate a flow greater than that set. Uh, and so this would be something uh, like a pressure support um, where you you have pressure being held but it's set on a flow. Um, also in uh, volume control where you have preset flow, uh, you're not going to generate flow greater than you set. So that would be something like you set the AC or volume control to 60 liters per minute. So that's your flow limited. Uh, pressure limiting, uh, that's you pressure control and you set up the pressure to be 20 centimeters of water. And the ventilator is going to take it up in a ramp to get to that 20 and it's going to hold it there. And you're not going to generate higher pressure than that. And then going down to volume, uh, this one is one we're all familiar with. You set a tidal volume of 460 and the ventilator is going to get that volume generated and it's not going to go higher than that. So these are just limit sets that you're telling the ventilator not to give more than. Uh, and then finally the last variable is going to be cycling and this is how you terminate the breath because otherwise the ventilator is just going to continue to push air. So it has to know when is it that I want to stop giving that breath. And so uh, there's a bunch of ways that this happens and, and there's actually probably the most desynchrony on cycling out of any of them um, when you talk about patient ventilator desynchrony. So uh, time cycle is just you set when it stops. And so this may be pressure control. I'm going to put in pressure 20 and I'm going to have an eye time of 1.2. So at the end of that 1.2 seconds, it's going to terminate the breath. Uh, flow cycle, this is mostly something that we see in pressure support. Uh, and the patient takes a spontaneous breath, ventilator gives them a pressure to help them breathe, 
and then it measures the peak pressure, and when it falls below, again, a preset, you set what you want that flow to be. When it falls below that level of pre, or the peak flow, that it terminates. So it could be when I get to 70% of the peak flow, the ventilator is going to kick off. Or when I get to 30% of that peak flow, the ventilator is going to kick off. And so that just is kind of creating a, a situation which the patient doesn't want to have to continue to exhale against a a large amount of pressure, flows coming down, we're ready to go into the expiratory cycle. Okay? Um, this isn't something that we see in our sick patients because we're not setting this variable of really outside of pressure support. And then we have pressure cycle termination. So uh, peak inspiratory pressure is achieved, uh, and when that happens, the ventilator is going to kick off. And then the volume cycle, once that target volume gets achieved, the ventilator's going to kick off. So you'll, uh, you'll see a few of these whenever we just set up different modes of ventilation. But the simplistic part of it is just how do we tell the ventilator to quit giving it that? So that's really all it breaks down to. And then we, we really have three basic types of breaths. Uh, a mandatory breath, assisted and spontaneous, and the difference is, is just what the ventilator is doing and how much support it's giving. So in a mandatory breath, this is something that says you tell it it needs to give 12 breaths a minute. You're coming up on that time frame where it's calculating I need to give a breath, and it gives a breath. Whether the patient is awake, responsive or not, it's going to push that breath. An assisted breath is more so along the side of the awake patient, and you're in a mode that doesn't have... Uh, non-supported breaths and so the patient is breathing at 20 times a minute your rate's 12 eight of those breaths whenever they generate it spontaneously is going to be a fully assisted breath meaning that the ventilator is going to give them the full support that you set and then a spontaneous breath is just a breath that the patient is going to be taking and this will be in a mode where you don't have fully supported breaths like SIV where uh, you can then set a pressure support, but let's say your pressure support is zero and you have a, a rate of 12 and the patient's breathing 20, eight of those breaths are going to be spontaneous breaths with zero ventilator support, even pressure support. So uh, that would be the type of spontaneous breath. Okay, so the, just kind of nuances and terms based upon what type of mode you've set up. Uh, and then, so, waveforms, um, to some degree. We're going we're gonna to do more in a second, but uh, this is going to be something like a, a volume control, uh, and this is an, on a pressure tracing waveform. And so, we have a, probably two of the really big important things to realize, at least from volume control, is we have two different pressures. We have a peak pressure, we have a plateau pressure. Our peak pressure is really measuring the resistance of the airways. Uh, and so the higher your resistance, the higher your peak pressure. That's how much you're having to push against the, the bronchioles in the lung, or the ET tube, or the combination of both. And then the compliance is really reflected by the plateau pressure. And so when we talk about ARDS and uh, restrictive type lung disease, we're talking about decreased compliance, and that's going to manifest more in our plateau pressures. When we talk about obstructive airways disease, asthma, COPD, these types of, of more bronchial diseases, this, we're going to be looking for to be able to control the real presence desktop. What? what? <laughs> so when we talk about uh, obstructive lung diseases, we're talking more about the, the peak pressures, and these are manifested uh, by these higher full curve there. This separation right here is just an inspiratory pause. So. I know this is becoming a thing of the past now that everyone's getting put on PRVC. You're not seeing this, 
But if you set up just your standard AC mode with or volume control mode with an inspiratory pause, you're going to see a curve where your pause is then going to reflect the plateau pressure. Okay. Your baseline is your PEEP. Most of the time you're going to be setting that at five. But it could be, you know, we'll just imagine that's 10, there's 15, and then the curves are going to start and terminate wherever that PEEP level is. And then one extra thing to pay attention to is going to be this term over here called auto PEEP. And this is PEEP that is intrinsic to the lung. And this should not ever really be ignored because it, it has a lot of physiologic important consequences. Now when we talk about full compliance, our compliance is given to us by the difference in the plateau pressure minus the PEEP. And we have to calculate in auto PEEP plus PEEP, so it's total PEEP. Plateau pressure minus total PEEP gives us our lung compliance. And so you can calculate out lung compliance this way and find out what your compliance is. So those are kind of what the different kind of uh, physiologic uh, variables you can calculate out from these uh, waveforms. Uh, and we'll do these when we're trying to determine what our, what our lungs are doing. All right, so then we're just going to go through some ventilator curves for the different types of modes that you're going to commonly see. So this one is volume control or assist control. So we'll call it AC mode or volume ventilation. Um, and you have all of the breaths looking the same. Tidal volumes are all coming out the same. And the flow waveforms are all looking the same. So this is what you're expected to see in standard AC mode. Um, who can tell me whether this patient is spontaneously breathing or not? I'm seeing some head nods. How do we know that it's a spontaneously breathing patient? That's perfect. A little dip in the pressure curve. So this thing right here. So patient is moving the diaphragm down, expanding, and initially that's done without a change in the flow. So you have a drop in your pressure. It senses that drop in pressure and then fully supports the breath. All right, so that is one part that we look at. And normally on the ventilators, it's going to give you red and yellow curves, right? And red is... They're knocked out and not breathing. Yellow is they're initiating it. But if you don't have the luxury of those little highlighting things, then that's where you want to look. Now let's talk about flow curve form. So we talked a lot about auto peak a second ago. Where in the flow curve will auto peak manifest? And this is for you to look at at the bedside. So go in, it's alarming, you can look at waveforms and you can determine a lot of things pretty quickly. So, auto peak reflects in the flow curve and where would that manifest? So it's going to manifest in the expiratory limb, which is going to be down here, and your simply flow is not going to return to baseline before the next breath kicks in. And so, You'll have your breath come in, you're coming down, and then right about here, you're going to kick up into a new breath. And so you don't return to baseline. And that is reflective of auto peep. And if you're seeing that, things need to get adjusted because they're going to get into trouble. Auto peep continues to expand and to the point where you can hyperventilate or hyper expand the lung to the point where you can cause hemodynamic collapse. So it is something we need to pay attention to, especially in obstructive lung disease. And then let's go over to our volume curve. Let's say we're getting to about right here, and then we have a straight line come down. And then we get to here, and it comes back up again. But straight line down, it's saying that it's not 
getting the total exhale tidal volume out. So what's that going to be reflective of? So this is an easy way to pick up on if the ventilator is having some issue potentially in the circuit. So it's not, it has a circuit leak and you're losing your exhale tidal volumes. Maybe you have a deflated intratracheal tube cuff. You're having air leak around the cuff or, uh, and so the ventilator isn't getting all of the air back through the closed circuit. It's the air escaping. Or potentially maybe you have a bronchopleural fistula where you're losing air out into the chest cavity. So this will be reflected in the volume curves and that it won't give you the total volume back and come to baseline. The ventilator has no way to account for that, so it just drops a straight line down and then starts a new breath at the zero base point. So it always starts at a zero base point. So you're always going to initiate at zero breath or zero base point for your volume curve, but if it doesn't get all the volume back, you'll see a straight line. So these are just kind of quick troubleshooting things you can see in the, the, the curves. Uh, and these will vary onto the order, but they'll always tell you up in the left hand corner what they are. Most of the time, all ventilators put pressure at the top. But I think like on the maquettes, you have pressure and then you have flow here and then you have volume below. But you can always just look over at the left hand side and it'll tell you what it is. Okay, so see a big difference here now between my standard AC, everything looks the same. Now we get this chaotic mess of everything's a little bit different. So this is SIMB. And what SIMB says is it has mandatory ventilation, like AC, which is still a mandatory ventilation, but in the non-mandatory breaths, they are uh, spontaneous breaths, and they can be supported with pressure support. And what that does to your curves is it gives you a, let's say we have a pressure support of five here, and so the patient is generating these breaths, they're getting a pressure support of five, pressure support of five, generates another breath, pressure support of five, and then now it's time for one of these mandatory breaths. SIMB will try to sync with the patient, so it's going to try to figure out when they're breathing based upon pressure volume changes in the circuit, and then deliver that breath with them. So we're going along, these are all spontaneous breaths, and then we get the full ventilator supported, or ventilator breath. Okay? And we can see all of our curves change. And see, our volumes are different. Our pressures generally will be about the same because we're setting a pressure support most of the time. So our pressures will generally be about close. Our volumes can vary differently depending upon patient effort. And then our flows will be variable because flow is variable when you're talking about spontaneous uh, pressure support and breaths. Then we get to that final SIMB breath. So the, the nuts and bolts of that are different waveforms up until you get the machine breath. All right, and then we're going here, volume control. We see our volumes are really supported. Our flow curves look identical, and then these curves look really nice there. Now we're going to go to a different type where we have pressure control. Okay. So we're taking it up to a pressure and we're going to hold that pressure and that's how we're generating that breath by taking us up to a pressure and then pushing air to get the variable which is your volume. Here we take up, we hold we have an inspiratory time that you set on the ventilator. Say it's 1.2 seconds. It's pretty standard inspiratory breath. And then at the end of that, it terminates off. The nice part about pressure control is that the flow is a variable flow. It's not fixed flow like AC mode. And so patients will generate the flow that they want, which is more comfortable. 
The problem is, is that your volumes then become variable depending upon your compliance. Now, all of these are the same volume because we're fully supported with the same pressure, and it's not like our compliance is changing breath by breath. So, but the flow curves will look a little bit different than when we're over here. We have this fixed decelerating flow. Here we've got these sharp peaks decelerating, coming to zero point, expiratory flow. Does everyone see the difference there? Okay. And then the last curve we're talking about is pressure support. And these are just patient initiated. So if the patient does not breathe, they don't get a breath. Eventually, all modes, are, you know, our ventilators are safe now, so we have backup ventilation that will kick into. But if the patient doesn't breathe in pressure support, they don't get a breath. So they have to spontaneously initiate every breath, and then the machine just pushes a pressure that you set, which is what we call pressure support. So you set it 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever you like. The flow is generated by the patients. So they generate whatever flow that, that they like. And the volumes are going to be variable depending upon the effort that they put into it. And all you're doing is just supporting them with a little bit of pressure. So one, that pressure overcomes the endotracheal tube resistance. But then two, it also makes it easier to breathe by decreasing the work of breathing by providing pressure. Uh, most of the time we look at pressure support as kind of a... Uh, a weaning mode, we'll see what they do in pressure support before we fully excavate. Um, and so that's kind of it for those waveforms. Any kind of big questions over waveforms? I mean, there's a lot of useful information. Again, the big three things, <coughs> see if they generate a breath uh, for the pressure waveform. Volume seeing that the curve goes back to zero without dropping straight down can tell you that you're getting all your exhale tidal volumes back, that your circuit should be working well, that you're not having a cuff problem, that you don't have something going on in terms of the patient. And the flow curve, really, really important, is the audit peak. So those three things don't really change. Okay, so now we're going to initiate mechanical ventilation. So how do we do this? First and most important point of setting up the ventilator is use a mode you're comfortable with. Know what you're going to do. If you use a familiar mode, you should be able to troubleshoot it because it's easy to put something on, you just put some setting on it. Then troubleshooting where you went wrong, that's the hard part. 90 to 95 percent of patients get put on AC mode, or volume control ventilation, and that's great. There's nothing wrong. There's never been a study that really showed superiority over any mode of ventilation other than in ARDS, low tidal volume ventilation. But however you deliver that tidal volume, doesn't matter whether it's pressure control or volume control, as long as you keep the tidal volumes low. So as long as you're picking something that's familiar for you, you're good. So use the familiar mode. FiO2 almost always gets put at 100% whenever we initiate. Uh, or start the ventilator, and then you can work that down. For tidal volumes, we're always shooting for a tidal volume of uh, six to eight mils per kilo, and it used to be that six was the absolute number for air. Yes, that still exists, but then all the other conditions really didn't matter. Now we're learning more and more that pretty much everyone should be in a range of six to eight uh, for independent of the disease condition. And then we use PEEP to help keep alveolar uh, units open. And by keeping units open, this improves oxygenation. So again, the two things that affect oxygen from the ventilator side are the FIOT, the inspired oxygen content, and the PEEP. All right, so then how do we monitor? Vital signs. Always we look at the vital signs, the octopy sats, get a chest x-ray after we intubate them, make sure we don't have a right main stem, make sure we didn't get a pneumothorax. 
uh, and then we'll check an ADG in 30 minutes to an hour. And that really allows enough time just to kind of equilibrate from the trauma of inflammation. And then once all those things pass, you're good. Then you want to try to look at patient ventilator asynchrony and try to then tailor the ventilator to make sure the patient's coming. Hopefully that, that you know, that they're syncing with the ventilator because asynchrony probably leads to ventilator induced lung injury. All right. So monitoring ventilator parameters. So what are we looking at? Looking at the inspiratory pressures, and why is this important? So when we talk about ARDS, we talk about inspiratory pressures, plateau pressure, right? Plateau pressure is the thing that we know causes ventilator-induced lung injury. So we want that number under what? Third. Plateau pressure under 30. Uh, and this, this is probably pretty universal. We know in ARDS it's really bad, and we want to keep under 30. But probably all other conditions, we really should be keeping our plateau pressures under 30. Um, the lower you go, the better. So if your plateau pressure can be 20, you're doing better than if it's 30. But the absolute number there is 30. Then we want to look at expiratory volumes, and this is just making sure that we're getting everything back. It's been discussed a few times now. Lack of getting the full expiratory volume back means something is going wrong somewhere, and it's important to try to find out where that is to correct it. Auto peep, again, looking at that flow waveform, making sure that we don't have auto peep because of the development of, of hyperexpansion. And when your lungs hyperexpand, it literally compresses blood vessels. And so initially, it will compress the little pulmonary arteries. Then you're not getting good pulmonary blood flow. And if you get to the point where it's really bad, it will actually compress the IVC and start to compress the right ventricle. When that happens, you develop tamponade physiology. And you'll go into shock. Uh, ventilator alarms are our friend, right? That's your best friend. Constantly beeping at you, constantly annoying you. It's all, most of the time, going to be related to what? <laughs> pressure, right? <clears throat> high peak pressure, high peak pressure. Um, at times, it'll tell you that it's got what? Low minute ventilation. So those are probably the two things one are going to see. High peak pressure is low minute ventilation. And they normally go hand in hand. So, um, so we're talking about the high peak pressure. So if we're in volume ventilation, volume control ventilation, what's our variable? <laughs> we set the tidal volume, so what's variable? Pressure. 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 Right? So if you have a high peak pressure, what's that indicate? Stiff lungs or secretions. Good. Stiff lungs or high resistance. Perfect. So you've got decreased compliance or increased resistance. That's what's going to give you high pressures. So how do we tell the difference between high resistance and decreased compliance? Goes back to that peak inspiratory versus plateau. So do you have a high peak pressure alarm or do you have a high plateau pressure? The difference between peak and plateau is about five in a normal individual. So you walk in, uh, start hearing an alarm, you're busy with whatever many patients you have, you're going to ignore that alarm. So you come back a little bit later, it's still going off, you look in there and the sats are set. That's not good now. So now you run in there, and you're going, what's going on? You look at the ventilator, peak pressure 65. Plateau pressure is 20. So where's your problem? So it's a resistance issue. It's a resistance issue. So either they included the ET tube with secretions, or maybe they maybe they were a heroin overdose. Now they've woken up and they are literally biting through their tube. 
So they've clamped down the ET tube, you're not getting any pressure in, or you're not getting any volume in, which means your pressures are going up. All right, and so that's the big thing with those. So it's in the airways, the big airways. So maybe they're a severe asthmatic, maybe they missed a few breathing treatments and they're a bad bronchospasm. So all of these things kind of point towards either the bronchioles or the ET tube. All right, and then the other scenario is uh, you find a patient out on the floor, they're just aspirated, you hook them up to the vent, peak pressure's 50, plateau pressure's 45. So where's the bronchi? It's in the lung, right? So you have a severely low compliant lung, decreased compliant lung. Uh, other part of that is, you know, the intern that you saw, your favorite intern, comes in and puts a subclavian line and scrubs out, leaves needles everywhere. It's call me in the morning. 30 minutes later, you got a plateau pressure of 50 and a peak pressure of 55. What happened? Yeah. Pop the lung. So these things are very quick assessments you can make on a ventilator and just by looking at the waveforms. So peak and then plateau. Again, the difference should be about five, and that will tell you where your problem is, or at least give you a clue to where your problem is. All right? Um, we talk about uh, low minute ventilation. The minute ventilation is really reflective of uh, your ability to push the total volume in if you're in volume control. So if you're not getting your volumes in because your pressures are high, your minute ventilation is going to be low. The other place where this becomes important is if you're in pressure control. So if you're in pressure control, you set the pressure what you what you're varying. Volume, right? So in this case, you set up the ventilator. Things are looking good. You've got a minute ventilation of ten. 30 minutes later, you've got a mental ventilation of four. Clearly something happened, and it's reflective of no longer getting your volume. So either your compliance dramatically changed, your pressure's still 20, but when you were getting volumes of 480, now you're only getting volumes of 20, or 200. Okay, so your compliance changed, you're not getting the same volume, or your, uh, resistance changed and so you're not getting the same volume so it goes back to the same way um, and on those it, you actually look at the flow curves and how fast that slope is in the flow i wouldn't worry about those that 95 percent of patients are going to be in volume and that gets pretty advanced and i'll just confuse everybody so as i confuse myself so, all right Standard pressure curves, easy to follow, peak, plateau. So then we look at the inspiratory and expiratory ratios. And what does this affect? It affects your tidal volume, it affects your flow rate, and it affects your waveform. Um, when we do Volume control ventilation, we have fixed flow. What that means is you have an eye time of half a second, the exhale time dependent upon your overall rate. Right? So this is going to take a little bit of math, but we have a respiratory rate of 20, and then we have a flow rate of 60 liters per minute. That's set. You set the flow. You set the flow at 60 liters. You have a tidal volume set for 500. Okay. So how fast are you going to deliver that 500? At 60 liter per minute flow, so you're delivering half a liter in half a, sec in half a second. Okay. So you have an inspiratory time of half a second. And then your expiratory time depends on the total breaths per minute. In this case, you have breaths set at 20. And so you're getting an exhale time of two and a half seconds. 
right? So the total time, three seconds. Your flow is set at 60. If you increase your flow to 75, you're giving that 500 mils faster, which means you get more time for exhalation. This is set, whether we know it or not. The old maquette ventilators, you set your flow by setting your eye time. So it doesn't say it, but a lot of the newer ventilators, it actually says, here's your flow. This is you're dialing in your flow. Right? And so that becomes important for in inspiratory versus expiratory times. This all gets affected into auto peep, especially in obstructive airways diseases. People with bad COPD and asthma need high flows. So you'll come in and the flow may be set at 45 or 50 liters per minute and they're synchronous with the ventilator because they need higher flow rates. They don't, they don't get good exhalation times. They need good quick inspiratory times. So you increase your flow up to 60 and 75 liters per minute. And those are pretty standard flow times for exhale. So, if you're on the older ventilators, what you'll do is you'll increase or decrease your inspiratory time so that you have to give that tidal volume in a shorter period of time, leave longer for exhalation. Okay? Um, now, we just talked about how we would talk, how we would give that total. Uh, volume in that half second, leave two and a half seconds for exhalation. What happens when I take my respiratory rate from 20 to 10? So now I'm still giving flow at 60 liters per minute. I'm still giving that 500 tile volume in that half second because it's again 60 liters per minute, which means one liter per second. It means you're giving half a liter in half a second. But now I only have to give a breath every six seconds. So I give that inspiratory time of half a second, and now I have an expiratory time of four and a half seconds. Okay. So these are ways at which you can fix breath stacking. These are ways you can fix auto peak. This all affects your inspiratory versus expiratory time ratios. For obstructive airways diseases, you want uh, as high of an expiratory time as possible and as low of an inspiratory time as possible. For decreased compliant lungs, it doesn't seem to matter as much, but we're going ultra low tidal volumes. So to keep minute ventilation up, how do I have to adjust my vent? Tidal volumes go down, minute ventilation is respiratory rate times the tidal volume. So the only way to keep my minute ventilation the same is to bump my respiratory rate up. So that's why when we do these four, five, six mils per kilo, a lot of times we have to use respiratory rates of 18, 22, 24. So we have to keep that minute ventilation going. Okay. Cleared mud. I feel like everyone's just looking at me. I hate you. A lot like my wife. <laughs> Factors leading to inadequate expiratory time. Uh, so this just goes back to what we were saying. You don't get fully exhaled volume before the ventilator kicks back up, your respiratory rate's too high, or your inspiratory time's too long, or the patient's just breathing, you know, 40 times a minute still, and they're just breast stacking. We've all seen those. So this goes back to this curve again. Uh, <coughs> trying to get them to look pretty like this. And you can do things to try to fix that. Pressure control, how would we adjust? We would decrease our inspiratory time. We could take the, the ramp time up higher. So this, you could affect this slope here. You can make it longer, giving it more time to reach that pressure. And then you can also affect how long you hold that pressure. So that's where you adjust your pressure control. For your volume control, you can affect your flow. You can change that flow. Or you can change how we deliver that flow. We can do square wave ventilation where it comes across here. Or we can do decelerating flow or ramp flow. 
So those are two of the big ways that we can affect flow um, on assist control. This is how we were talking earlier on auto -peed. This is on your flow waveforms. So inhale, flow, coming down, starting the expiratory phase. <clears throat> You're trying to get out to zero, either the ventilator or the patient start the breath before you get to that zero flow point. So this level right here is measurable, and that is auto peep. So you can find out how much auto peep you have, and we'll play around with that on the ventilator in a little bit. So auto peep will manifest as increased respiratory pressures, hypotension, Decreased oxygenation. So how does PEEP, which we said is beneficial, improves oxygenation, how does it decrease? It goes back to by tamponade shock, essentially, obstructive shock. You hyperinflate, hyperexpand the lungs so much that you decrease your flow into the right heart and you get a hemodynamic collapse. So Let's say that this is happening. You've got a 22-year-old asthmatic coming in, status asthmaticus, and they get intubated. 20 minutes later, uh, they're hypotensive. They were blood pressure 120. Now they're 80 over 40. They did have oxygen of about 92. Now they're in the 80s. Interns running in there, cranking up the FiO2. We're at 100% now. Peep was set at five. He's breathing 35 times a minute. What's the one thing that you have to immediately do there? Take off the peep. Okay. So you can decrease your peep to zero, and that's not a bad idea. However, right now, he's in shock still. And so just by taking the peep down to zero isn't going to pull him out of shock. But we will get to your suggestion in a second. Can you deflate the cuff? You can deflate the cuff. Or the easier thing to do, take the ventilator out of the ET, off the ET tube. So disconnect the patient from the ventilator. And I've done this a few times. It can be scary because you have a patient in shock about to code, and the one thing don't think about doing is why would I pull my ventilatory support? But it is the ventilatory support in this case that's causing him to, to arrest. So pull the ventilator off, count to 30, count to 40, just slow breaths, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. By the time you get to about 30 or 40, blood pressures will be up, sacs will be up. So all you got to do is just let him exhale, let him come back to a normal setting. Then you have to do something, right? Because if you hook him back up, to the same ventilator, 20 minutes later, you're going to be doing the same thing. So that's where you adjust your peak. That's where you would adjust the settings to try to get your eye times, the E times right, decrease your auto peak. So uh, that's not, it's not a fun thing to do because you don't know if it's, you're, not, you're never positive that it's going to work, but most of the time it does. And if it doesn't, we're all in lot trouble. So this is where we go back to auto peep and how to adjust for that. So going back to that fun, complicated math we did where we talked about total cycle breaths, by decreasing our respiratory rate, we're basically increasing our expiratory time the most dramatically. The other ways you can do that, decrease your tidal volumes. The less tidal volume you give, the, the shorter amount of time that you're going to be able to get that breath delivered and then get into exhalation. Increase your flow. So if you're on a flow where you set the flow specifically on the ventilator, that's where you can increase your flow rates. Or if you're on a ventilator where you're adjusting eye times, decrease uh, your inspiratory time to increase your flow. And then the other thing, because he's generating so much auto peep, as you said, you can take the peep in these patients actually down to zero because they're going to have their own intrinsic peep, which is going to hold plenty of alveolar units open. So that's the first part of it. And then we're going to go through a few cases and then discuss 
liberation from liberation. Are there questions so far on that? No? And really, a lot of this is just theoretical until you actually go apply it. So hopefully you can take some of these things and go look at the ventilators on your patients and say, okay, this is what you need to do. So let's take that same patient, the fun 68-year-old with the COPD exacerbation. Everything is the same as we talked about, except now we've changed our pH to a more reasonable level of 7.21. So we say, all right, let's use non-invasive ventilation. And that's the right thing to do. You should. If you take this type of patient with these types of numbers, even with this type of respiratory acidosis, the argument in the data suggests that you should try non-invasive on And so you do it for an hour, but you shouldn't ever just put them on a BiPAP and say, we'll see what it looks like in the morning. It's every hour assessments, if not sooner. So you put them on, doesn't work, he's an extremis. So what ventilator settings do you want to use? And I know it's probably written out there on your page, <laughs> but you can make up your own. Assist control, AC mode, pretty standard. I think that's what everyone's going to put on. If I do get set at 100% initially, what do you think you want your rate to be? So your, your obstructive airway is high resistance, so you want your rate to be pretty low. So pick a, a low number. And then, 12. What's that? 12. 12 is a good number. 12 is a very good number. Uh, and then uh, a peak of five. So we're going to go with a pearl here. Um, what is a ventilator setting that is almost universal for everybody? That you could put somebody on and keep them alive for enough time that you can get somebody to come in to help you. And so maybe that's you're out in the community and the patient gets intubated and you know, it's going to be three hours before they get transferred up here or wherever they're going. AC mode, tidal volume of six mils per kilo, rate of 12, beat of five. That will ventilate and oxygenate 95 to 99% of patients for enough time to get them to somewhere where they can use, you know, more invasive modes or more complicated modes or more advanced modes. So that'll, that'll get you where you need to be. Um, the caveat on the tidal volume, though, is six mils per kilo of what? Ideal body weight. That's right. So the 230 kilo person gets ventilated at six mils per kilo of ideal body weight. So if you weren't to use that, you'd have tidal volumes of two, you know, two meters. And the thing that I've never forgotten that was told me one time is lungs don't get fat. So they never they never get bigger as the patients get bigger. They stay the same size. If anything, they're getting smaller because they're getting compressed. So uh, always adjust for ideal body weight. So in this case, they put up AC. 100%, they use 10 mils per kilo, rate of 14, to 5. We go to monitor them, and things don't go so well. So you check on them in 30 minutes, and these are all the parameters you can pull off the ventilator, you get an ABG, get vitals. What happened? Where are we? Where, one, what are problems? And two, how do we fix those problems? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So your, your peak pressures are high. Your plateau pressures are also high, but the difference is much more than five here. So you do have at least a degree of 
of some degree of intrabrinkable problem, but I would argue that the majority of your problem is going to be in your resistance. You have auto peep. Eight of auto peeps high. Your I to E time is 1 to 1.5. That's not very good in obstructive lung disease. You have a significant respiratory acidosis still, and you're hypotensive and more tachycardic than when you started. If we're only looking at oxygen, we're doing great. You got a PO2 260. Anyway, that's probably too bad. I mean, this guy probably lives with a PO2 of about 60 normally, and now we're at 260. So we're well above where he normally lives. So we've got hypoventilation, meaning we still have this respiratory acidosis going on. We've got high peak pressures, we've got high plateau pressures, we've got auto peak, hypotension, tachycardia. So, what factors can you adjust? We've all said tidal volumes can be lowered, right? Mm -hmm. 10 mils per kilo is probably not appropriate. Our rate's too high. So we could decrease our rate down to eight. And if we do that, we simply cut the rate in half. It gives us a lot longer exhale time. I don't know what I just did there. Good. Um, and then you can even adjust the peep here. If you needed to, this type of scenario, this would not be inappropriate to go ahead and disconnect him for a few seconds. Let him re equilibrate and then start back over on the vent. All right, so the, the nuts and bolts of ventilating obstructive lung diseases try to use lower tidal volumes. Allow adequate expiratory time. So you want I to E times of 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5. Monitor the auto peak level because this is something that is going to affect your hemodynamics. Um, you don't have to overventilate them. You're not trying to get their pH normal. All you're trying to do is get the acidosis down a little bit. So pHs of 7.3 are fine. And then Get the steroids and bronchodilators so that eight hours later you're doing a little better. Um, the bronchodilator effect is going to be relatively immediate, but in these really bad, bad patients, you're not going to see that big of an effect. And so that's when we'll hook them up to continuous albuterol and just try to, to open as much as possible. All right, so then we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about decreased compliance. So, 25 year old, uh, you know, college kid goes out partying, gets down, down. EMS gets out there, they're tunded. So, they innovate them in the field, they don't vomit all the way in the pharynx, they're suctioning out, all kinds of stuff from the ET tube. SATs are 85% on an FI2 of 100%. What do you want to use? AC mode, pretty standard. FI2, we're 85% on the FI2 of 1, 100%, so that's not very good, but there's nothing more we can do there. What about tidal volume? So what condition are we dealing with? What is this here? Aspiration. Aspiration. And so if we aspirated and we're still in the in their early setting, what do we have? We have aspiration pneumonitis. So this is an inflammatory process going on. And this is going to develop into full ARDS if this isn't what we're already probably calling ARDS. So which is just non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So water, fluid, inflammatory markers, leaky capillaries. And this is where we have a lot of data to support. We can do things right on these patients to try to keep them from getting into really bad chronic lung disease. So hooking them up to AC mode, keeping their oxygen high for now, tidal volumes of six mils per kilo. Here we're going to initially use eight. 
uh, rate of 14, peep of 5. All these would be okay um, for initial settings. The problem with 6 mils per kilo is that it is uncomfortable. It's not physiologic. We breathe much higher than 6 mils per kilo. So we hook these patients up, and if they're awake, uh, they're going to be uncomfortable because it's just not enough volume. Uh, it's not enough flow. It's not enough anything. And so they can get pretty uncomfortable. So starting them off at 8 and then moving them down to 6 in an hour or two is a good strategy. And that's acceptable. So we want to monitor them. These are what we get. 88%, peak of 53, plateau of 49, and auto peak of zero, patient breathing 18, pH 7.39, PCO2 of 36, PO2 of 55. What kind of problems do we have here? Not oxygenating. Not oxygenating. Mm -hmm. And a plateau pressure is a 49. And this is a one-way ticket to fibrotic lung disease, air trauma. Bad things are going to happen with those kinds of plateau pressures. So this is decreased compliance. Normal difference between your peak and plateaus, but your plateaus are holding extremely high. And then you've got significant hypoxemia. So what factors affect the O2? The two biggest ones are going to be your FiO2 and your PEEP. To some degree, your tidal volume will affect your oxygenation, but only in the sense that it gives you mean airway pressure. And mean airway pressure directly relates to the uh, PaO2. So, but 95% of your oxygenation is going to be affected by your percent inspired oxygen and your P. So, what changes do you want to make here? If we can only affect oxygen by the FI2 and the P, and our oxygen is set at 100%, Where's the only thing we can adjust then? Peep. So we're going to crank our peep up. How are we going to do that? Who knows how to do that? So there's a nice guideline published. Uh, and this comes from uh, clinical research. Uh, and the people that did all this are called the ARDSnet Society. And so he typed in ARDSnet and peep. The first Google hit is going to be a uh, FiO2 peak table. And it gives you a guide. If you're on this much oxygen, we recommend this much peak. And there are going to be two tables. There's a high peak and a low peak. And they study this. And there's no difference between high peak and low peak group, except for in very severe ARDS, the high peak group probably does a little bit better. But this is where it's going to sound crazy because we just don't do it the way we should. But if you're on 100% FiO2, the low peak group is going to recommend a peak of 18. If you're in the high peak group on 100%, they're going to recommend a peak of 22 to 24. So we're talking in ARDS using very high peaks to recruit. Um, the other thing we've got to do to make adjustments here, we've got to get this down to six. And there's more and more saying that even adjusting down lower is probably beneficial to five and four mils per kilo of ideal value. If we're going to do that, we're going to drop our minute ventilation. So what do we need to do to our respiratory rate? We need to increase our respiratory rate. And this isn't a problem. Because we have zero out of people, we're returning to baseline, we're not having problems with that. So we have room to work in our respiratory rate. So for ventilating these patients, the important part is to maintain oxygenation. And we're going to maintain oxygenation even at the expense of a little bit of hypercarbia. 
So we call this permissive hypercapnia. We allow the PCO2 to come up. We're not moving as much volume. We have a tracheal and ET2 dead space with about 150 mils. So when we get down to 400 mils, then we're only pushing, here's the math, 250. There you are, So, um, 250 mils of tidal volume when you take out the dead space. So that's really nothing. You get even lower to 360, I've seen patients 340, you're, you're really not getting very much ventilation at that point in time. And that's okay. Let the PCF2 come up. Literature supports go into a pH of 7.2, all the way in some cases down to 7.15 before the acidosis then becomes problematic to the point where you have to start to do something else. The key for ARDS is plateau pressure. Keep your plateau pressures under 30. And this can be really hard to do, uh, especially in these really severe patients. And so if that becomes problematic, you can paralyze. There's really good data to support paralytics. Um, they did a randomized trial out of France and they used cisatricure or Nimbex for the first uh, 48 hours and very severe ARDS and they showed the mortality benefit. So they paralyzed them. And then the other thing that we're slowly, slowly adopting is prone ventilation. Uh, and that is supported by a New England Journal of Medicine article from 2013 that showed prone ventilation had a mortality benefit. And so those are the things you can do after you've done the absolute maximum you can do on the ventilator. So then the next thing we're going to talk about is discontinuing mechanical ventilation. So are there, before we move to that, are there questions over kind of the big strategies in obstructive lung disease versus restrictive lung disease? Anything you all want to discuss that we didn't put in here that you have questions over? Be shy. It's looking like they hate me. Still, still. All right. Going to discontinuing mechanical ventilation. So, the big things here. Did why did you get to bake? And whatever reason you intubated them for, did you fix that? And if you haven't fixed it, don't try to excavate. It's not going to go well. It's going to go terrible. So if they came in with an asthma exacerbation, did you fix the asthma? Are they breathing well? Are the peak pressures low? Do you hear good breath sounds? No audible wheezing. If they came in with the ARDS, are they no longer hypoxemic? Are the plateau pressures low? Are they spontaneously breathing well? Are they looking OK? Are they out of shock? So. Did you correct the underlying problem? Next, this is pretty much a checklist. One, two, three, four, five. Next, are they on, quote, minimal ventilation? So, for minimal, minimal mechanical ventilatory support. Meaning, the FI2 is at 40% and PEEPs 5. This is pretty universally accepted. That's minimal settings. Do you have an acceptable acid base balance? And the acid base balance is going to be reflective of the respiratory problem, or some underlying severe metabolic disturbance. Trying to extubate people with a pH of 7.0 is probably a bad idea. Are they hemodynamically stable? So they may be on 40% 5, but they've got a belly that is full of pus, and they're on 20 mics of lead with it. That's not the patient to extubate. So keep them intubated, provide support while you fix whatever underlying problems going on. So uh, this is uh, seemingly common sense, but we, we break this quite a bit. Um, and then, are they awake? You know, not somnolent. They're not knocked out. They didn't develop ICU delirium and they're just cuckoo. Do they have 
sufficient ventilatory drive. So the ventilator, they're not riding the ventilator. They're over-breathing the vent. They're not relying on it to do all the work. So once you've gotten to all of this, now we're ready to say, let's give them a shot at breathing on their own. So before we just yank the tube, we kind of want to give ourselves an idea that they're going to they're gonna fly. So you do that through a spontaneous breathing trial with the ventilator, and this is where we'll put them into pressure support. Most commonly, that's going to pressure support five, peak five. All the data and trials support doing a 30-minute trial like this. We used to do two hours. I think we're shortening that. Fine. So put them on pressure support, five and five. Let them go 30 minutes. Do they get to kidney? Does the respiratory rate go up to 45? They're not ready. So their heart rate 160? They're not ready. So if they maintain hemodynamic stability during that trial, it looks promising. So then the last part we do, once they've gotten to the end of that trial, is what we call weaning parameters. And we'll get a vital capacity, negative inspiratory force, negative inspiratory pressure, a rapid shallow breathing index, and a minimum ventilation. All of the data really comes from this, the RSBI. And that is the frequency of the tidal volume in the years. So, you have frequency of 22 and a tidal volume of 500, you do 22 divided by 0.5. And that gives you the RSPI. If that number is less than 105, you're golden. The data supports that 80% of patients excavated with an RSPI of less than 105 will stay excavated. Now notice that there is a caveat that of 20% are not going to do well. And so the argument then becomes that if your extubation rate is 100% successful, you're too conservative. Some patients need to fail. That's okay. So I'm big on the RSPI and then a clinical assessment. So I walk in, look at them, they follow in commands. So they have strength, and we test overall body strength by having them do a head lift, and they lift their head off the bed and hit your hand. They can do that, they've got pretty good muscle. RSBI under 105, I'm good to go. Other people look at the NIF, so we really like that to be minus 20. And then there's no magic number on a vital capacity, but the higher your vital capacity, the better off. So if you're pulling a tidal volume of 100, you know, 1,500 uh, milliliters, you're you're going to breathe okay. And then minute ventilation is directly reflected by the RPI. So I don't ever pay attention to minute ventilation because that's going to be assessed by the frequency of the tidal volume uh, in the rapid shallow breathing. So you pull it, they do well, or 30 minutes later they're crashing, you put the tube back in, and then you try to reassess what happened. A lot of times what's going on is when they fail, you're either got laryngeal edema, laryngeal spasm, or there's some disconnect between them doing really well on positive pressure ventilation, and then when you take the breathing tube out, they're going to negative pressure breathing, meaning they're generating negative pressure. And whenever you remove that positive pressure, you lose some of that push to keep alveolar fluid and other inflammatory markers into the interstitial, and so you'll lose that. So while it's not truly supported as much anymore, I like to, in those types of patients, which I think are going to have some type of cardiac dysfunction, either diastolic disease or have systolic heart failure, to give them a what we call T-piece trial. So they do well, we get parameters on the vent, everything looks good actually disconnect the ventilator, leaving the ET tube in place, and do blow by oxygen. That's uncomfortable. They're breathing through a high, you know, small ET tube. It's very uncomfortable. So that needs to be assessed quickly. 15, 20 minute trial. Your hemodynamics still look good. The tube can come out. They decompensate in that 10 minute period. Then maybe you need to reassess whether this is the best idea to do. 
you could try to get their volume status a little bit better, trying to improve the cardiac contractility. So there's all those different things you can try to do to, to make sure that you successfully extubate. But that's that. Questions over liberation. Yep. And then I found this on the internet. Because everyone ends with a witty slide, and I don't have witty slide, so I stole this and put it on there. And it's complicated waveform analysis. We get these on our board exams, and most of the time I have no idea what I'm looking at. And they don't either, so it makes me feel better. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So now we need to go play with the bill. <laughs> Y'all need to use the restroom. There's some restroom right here in the hallway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did y'all say that you had the ventilator in the room? Yes, we have the ventilator in the room. Okay, do you need me to adjust the camera to where it is? That would be wonderful. We're over here on the opposite side of where Dr. Cox is. Okay, let me work on that. Give me just a I second. Think I think I did this yesterday. I had to do it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's set up to just take camera two and it should be automatically rotating. Yep. Perfect. Okay, is that what y'all want? Yes. Um, zoom in on the actual screen itself. Okay, you want me to zoom in a little bit more on it? Okay. I think that would provide a better image. <laughs> I just don't think it's going to show up. It's going to show up. If it doesn't show up, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I don't know how much more I can go. Let me see. Okay, that looks about as far as I can. Is, is, will that work for you, or you need different? That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you're taking it.
this is operating on pretty standard. Uh, got a relatively compliant line, relatively resistant airway, and then we're going to see that we. So now we've got pressure, flow, volume. Cooperate. You're supposed to be able to change the resistance. We're supposed to go to a really resistant one. Your peak pressure is supposed to go down. It's not doing that, so let me show you what I mean by auto peak. So, where are we going to see auto peak? So, going back to those things.
Who wants to come make changes? Who wants to fix them? Press buttons. <clears throat> you can't kill the test. I could probably kill it. So, ventilators are pretty simple. You press a button until it turns a different color, and you adjust that, and you hit it again so the color goes away. Right. So, what happened? And we're trying to correct the auto key. We're trying to fix his obstructive light. Okay. No, no, no. 60%, we'll just leave the oxygen. give the tidal volume of you know, 2 liters and peak airway pressure 90, it's got a way to kick out the rest of the breath, so it's not going to work at all. So after a certain peak level of pressure, it will stop trying to give that breath a warm breath out through the machine. So here we have a problem of tidal volume, and this is just small little one, so it's not going to take 60. So now the title volume we can do is 200. So we can adjust that down. And then we have the PIP of 13. But we really don't have an oxygen problem in obstructive disease. So this, in association with them having the PIP, even though we've already corrected the value, you can take that back down to a reasonable level of 5. Or if you're really struggling, reflect decreased performance. Got it. So this is the aspiration. So I come up to the ICU with these settings. What do you want to do? You want to increase speed. What do you want to go to? 
18, I like it. Some of my trade easy will be. They often come up and press buttons if you like. It's more fun than that. It's not a rule. Threat rate of 32, target ball, or title volume of 700, and now peak of 18, and FI2 of 60%. Let's just say our stats are running 70. Right? After the What's that? After you increase Alright, good. Go up to 100%, peak of 18. Now our stats are under 63, or I mean, stats are. 80, 89. Okay. Now we're going to act like we're still at 100%, so I think it's 80 Alright, so we're going to be on 100%. Now it's not 80 So, what else do we want to do? This is what I mean by that line now, okay? See how it comes down and resets itself? That line. That's that zero point line where it's got to get down to zero to get to the next graph. So it's just going to give up, reset itself to zero. And that's what I mean by the volume. Okay? So now you can just play around with nodes. SIV. What's the set rate? Set rate's at 15.
see how it sinks with me. Alright. So that's what SIP looks like. A special setting that I really use for advanced hypoxemia. It's two peak pressure. You have a high peak and low peak. Pressure mode ventilation, two volumes are varied. You have to pay attention to the volumes, your curves, and everything else is entirely different. So we're going to use the other way that's called inverse ratio, and it's a little bit So we're going to use high eye times. Four seconds, five seconds. And we're going to use low times for our low seconds. Point five is pretty reasonable. We're going to use very high pressures for our high because we're in the tractor we box in this, so we've got to stay high. And then we're going to use almost zero for low because you're never going to fully be for your high. And then we don't, I don't really have to use pressure support in this mode. So this is going to be a good 
So we ventilate it with our releases. These actually look relatively skinny, and we probably can have that terminate a little bit sooner so we can control it. What do you want to see?
where where do you get benefit out of using a C method? There, SID is again not a bad method. Just think potentially there's just a huge debate between the SICU and the MICU. SICU loves SID, MICU hate SID. MICU is more of AC mode, surgical SU is hate AC That's a problem. It's raging. But part of the problem with SID is you have two different breath cycles, two different breath initiations to do breath supports. And so they know this from studies that there's a lot of neuro physiologic input that goes into that. It doesn't allow comfortability or sleep. And so in sick patients, generally don't hook up a 7 It's not to say that. If I want to better control PCO2, so let's say I have brain infarct or hemorrhagic stroke, I want CO2 levels down. I want high CO2. High CO2 is the enemy there. So I hook him up to AC mode. He's got neuro dysregulation. He's breathing 40 times. If I fully support all of his breaths, I'm going to have a PCO2 at zero. <laughs> He's going to breathe so fast. Um, Over exaggeration. But I don't want to keep him about 30. So, Hook him up to AC, he's breathing past fully supported, he's getting huge tidal volumes every time. He goes down to PCO2 at 25. One way that I can slow that, I, can't, I don't want to paralyze him because I need good neurological exams. So, one way that I can change that is to go in this, put a mandatory rate of aim so that I know he's getting good breaths, but then have him in pressure support for the others. And I can dial down that pressure support to control those tidal volumes. So, that's some way that I can. So it just depends on, on different things and what you're trying to accomplish as to how you're going to use different uh, supports. So This is the other part where we didn't get to see because here we have a ramp pattern. So this is a decelerating ramp flow. This is fixed flow. So we're in AC mode, so we have fixed flow. Pressure will get variable flow. So again, pressure, you can sometimes set patients up a little bit better than pressure because they can have variable flow. In AC, SIMV, we're fixed flow patterns because we're in volume control. And we can set how we deliver that flow. Give them an initial high flow, which is more comfortable, and then decelerate that as they continue to breathe. Or we can go into square wave, where we shoot them up, we hold them at a constant pace, and then we just drop the flow back down. So there's really no right or wrong on these. You're just trying to sync up. Now, you'll see some flow patterns that have more flow patterns. That's just a higher decelerating. And this one is probably just not sure it uses flow. It doesn't have to be a flow. So everyone will pretty much use a decelerating ramp to some degree. Or a square wave for protection. Okay. So now we're back in the study. Holding a fixed inflation 
but uh, it's not physiologic. Old ventilators just used to not have options, so now all these new ventilators have all the options. Play. <laughs> 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 That's really all I got. So I think. Can you go back to some of these people? Yeah. Very basic settings. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Those are basic settings. <laughs> two hour CDs back here for you. Make sure you complete the evaluation and after you've done that and handed it to me, then I can give you your uh, CD. Okay, we're